Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. Welcome to our mini series, Veblen's World of Luxury. Tonight, our experts will talk about the Sino-European luxury trade and the making of the early modern world. In upcoming programs, we'll expand on this series with discussions by industry experts and also feature some of our UChicago and Chicago Booth alumni who are currently leaders in the luxury goods industry. If audience members have questions tonight, you can submit them through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. And I also encourage you to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to the e-news for the latest programs and also follow us on most social media platforms. We'll wrap up tonight's program with a poll and more information about upcoming events you may be interested in. So be sure to stay until the very end. Let's start tonight with a brief introduction of our speaker and moderator. Ken Pomerantz, our faculty director of the University of Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong will moderate tonight's webinar. Professor Pomerantz is a distinguished university professor of modern Chinese history and in the college. Professor Pomerantz's work focuses mostly on China and he's also very interested in comparative and world history. Most of his research is on social, economic and environmental history. But he's also worked on state formation, imperialism, religion, gender, and other topics. Ken, thanks again for joining us today. I'll hand the stage over to you so you can introduce our guest and begin the discussion. Thanks very much, Mark, and welcome everybody. Um, so our speaker tonight, Fernando Arteaga, is the academic director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets, which is hosted at the University of Pennsylvania's Economics Department where he's also a senior fellow. He received his PhD in economics from George Mason University and his bachelor's degree in economics from the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City. His research interests lie at the intersection between economic history, new institutional economics and development economics. His research dwells on the institutional properties that create incentives for political union or disunion. Um, in other words, why some nations are large and some are small. He focuses particularly on the case of the Spanish empire in the 16th to 19th centuries and the process of fragmentation that led to the creation of the Latin American countries. And in connection with that, he's also developed considerable study or devoted considerable study to the export of precious metals from the Americas, especially Mexico in the 16th to 19th century which as we'll see, flowed to Asia as well as Europe and was part of a broader trade for luxury goods such as Chinese silk and porcelain, Indian cloth and pepper, and Southeast Asian spices, which as we'll see, transformed the world. So Fernando, let me turn it over to you for about 10 minutes and then I'll take 10 minutes afterwards. Okay, thank you again, Professor. So let me share my slides. So thank you everyone. I will start by kind of providing a brief overview of the institutional properties that govern trade between the East and West, particularly between America. And I will focus mostly on Mexico and China. And I will also provide kind of a brief analysis of, of that. But let me start by, by talking a little bit about this topic in relation to basically luxury. What is luxury? and what we can learn from history. And let me just start by kind of telling an anecdote. When I was a student, an undergrad student, I always read about economic history and things about economic trade in the past. And I honestly, admittedly think, uh, thought that it was kind of dry, boring, because mostly we, th we talk about things like spices, uh, cloves, sugar, things that nowadays, admittedly, I can actually acquire five minutes walking distance from my supermarket. And I thought, well, what, what is the exciting thing about these things? This is not exciting. But however, then I realized that I was committing a mistake, that the exciting thing was learning about the process which led to the creation of the modern world. 
and how these things that in the past were quite luxurious are no longer luxurious. And in this regard, I will admittedly say that this is something that I kind of disagree with Professor Veblen in the statements that the evolution of economic growth through time is not just about social rankings, but also about the qualities of some goods and how people enjoy them. And nowadays, these kind of goods are actually readily available, but in the past they were not. So how did we arrive into this kind of world? Later on, we will see another example in which I will totally agree with Professor Veblen about the things that I have said, but in general, most of these other uh, goods actually kind of exemplified what it is different in terms of luxury in the past and in the present. The one thing that I would like to emphasize kind of as a background of what I'm going to talk about is that the first kind of characteristic of this kind of goods, because we are talking about the pre-modern world in which where they were high transportation costs, just let us imagine nowadays we can actually just have a Zoom meeting between Philadelphia, Chicago, and Hong Kong in a quite basically magical way. But in the past, of course, that was not true. So we had to basically spend a, a couple of years if not to basically move these goods. So they had to have a large value to weight right, ratio. That's why only very small uh, kind of commodities were actually being transacted. And uh, let me start just, uh, my focus will be mainly in Spain, but I, before focusing on Spain, I need to talk a little bit about Portugal because the Portuguese were the first to arrive into China and they were incentivized just as the Spanish to arrive to China precisely because they wanted to basically get the spices from the sources from Southeast Asia. And at this, in, at this point in time in the 16th century, well, the trade was dominated by basically middlemen, basically the Ottoman Empire and the Venetians. And so there was an economic incentive to try to basically go another way, go basically just uh, uh, they, be, finding another road. And that's how the Portuguese went to Africa, South of Africa. They created a lot of settlements. They conquered some of them through Africa, through India, through Southeast Asia. And they basically, that's how we arrived into Macau, which is basically the first trading hub, pardon me, the first European trading hub in the region, which more or less was settled in the middle of the 16th century. So how, do, how does this relate to Spain is that from the 1580 to 1640, both Portugal and Spain were kind of unified under one crown. That does not mean that they were one nation in the way in which we, will, we nowadays think about nations, but nonetheless, that means that if there was a war, of course, they will most likely be analyzed. And if there were some military help needed, they will actually fight each, each other in, in, in specific. The Dutch arrived in the 17th century and basically started conquering some of these lands. So the basically uh, wars in Southeast Asia between Dutch uh, and the Portuguese and the Spanish kind of defined a lot of modern uh, aspects like, I don't know, like, like law, the sea law, for example, was quite irrelevant. So, what that does mean is that the Spanish also had incentives to arrive. When you uh, Columbus arrived, famously trying to reach into, into, into Asia, they never stopped trying. The Spanish arrived into Manila in the middle 16th century. And then they also wanted kind of to settle into China. In fact, there is kind of a, the, there was a lease in the end of the 16th century that basically the Chinese actually allowed the Spanish to settle. But uh, some area around here, some in the Canton area, the, the specific area is unknown. But what we know is that they never actually, they, they left quite uh, rapidly. And they did so mostly because the Portuguese complained to the Portuguese king, which was also the Spanish king. And the Spanish said, well, I will leave and I will just settle in Manila. And that is where basically we will conduct all of, of our trade. Now, what was happening in Manila is that uh, previous to the arrival of the Spaniards, there was already a kind of a loose trading network in which the Chinese merchants already were very familiar with the region, of course, and they more or less showed the Spanish how to do this. And there was already kind of a community of Chinese living in Manila, and that community of people actually persisted throughout the Spanish times. And these Chinese merchantmen actually acted kind of as an agents of basically work, uh, workshops or other merchants within China. I will talk mostly refer to the Canton area, but there were, of course, other Chinese uh, areas that also had agents within this, uh, within Manila. And 
just imagine the complexity of the trade that we are talking about here. So this is kind of a picture that relates to the way in which the Manila Galleon basically was loaded. And I've done some research about the, this, uh, the Manila and so back of the envelope calculations led me more or less to state that one ship more or less carried 2% of entire GDP of the Spanish empire for almost 200 and 250 years. So it was a huge ship carrying a huge cargo of things that were quite valuable in terms of high value to the weight ratio. But nonetheless, it was very packed, as you can see. And this is not something, this is not a modern way of carrying things. This takes time. This is very difficult. In fact, the modern cranes or the cranes that we are used to, of course, did, did not exist back then. They were only starting to be developed really in the 19th century. So this was a pretty modern, difficult way to load things. So this was a very complex aspect to move things from Asia to from China to Manila, from Manila to Mexico, and then also Mexico, the kind of distributed goods to both South America, to Peru, but also to basically Europe in Spain. So it was a quite complex endeavor that we are talking about. So what were these kind of goods? I will first focus on the Chinese goods and how this relates to the basically luxury in America. And then I will talk more about basically the payment, which is silver, which is something that of course America is famous. So these are some examples that are basically pictures from Mexico City that still exist in Mexico City, some goods that arrive from China, from, uh, from the Galleon. And basically, uh, of course, silk, porcelain, of course, there was also trade from other parts besides China, but I will not talk about those. And from these things, for example, porcelain that was quite high demanded. There were generic things that were basically produced in China and were exported. And in fact, I wouldn't say that there was an industry in China, but I would say that there were kind of some sex sector in China that devoted itself exclusively to the export of goods that were devoted to the export, not for the private consumption within China. And we know that because it had they had different a set of motifs within the within the ceramic, within the porcelain that was basically more Western. We also know, if you look into the second photo, that the trading complexity of the roots was so high that Mexicans, and this is kind of an example of a dinner where dinner plate that actually was contracted to be made within China that had kind of the crest of families. So rich families within Latin America, within uh, Spanish America actually contracted China's merchants to do a specific China where uh, to be consumed by them. This was not to be exported to Europe or to be distributed. These were rich, mer rich merchantmen in America, in Spanish America that contracted this. This also, and this is related to basically Beblen, <laughs> This also led to a huge industry within Mexico, paradoxically, of people trying to copy Chinese goods. And this is, of course, in the 18th century, this became famous also in Europe. This is known as chinoiserie. But in Mexico, this started much earlier because we had the uh, goods much, much earlier. So these are basically Mexican copies of goods that were originally created within China. And basically in Mexico, we tried, of course, to copy uh, porcelain. We never achieved kind of that degree of quality, but we, we tried. And you can see that in, in, in a lot of places in Mexico. Even today, kind of the ceramic industry in Mexico, more or less, always it, itself, its beginnings to basically this process of copying. And so now you see kind of an example of what would Be Beblen could consider kind of pecuniary uh, emulation, which is just the idea that everybody knew that these things were luxurious, that people wanted to consume them. And this is something that they wanted to emulate. So they tried to basically consume them through copies, which was, of course, much, 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 much more cheaper. Now, uh, the thing, of course, is that this is not only porcelain. We also see kind of um, uh, woods. Also, a lot of furniture was ex exported from China to, to Mexico and to Europe. And the way in which we identify these things, besides just the quality, is that some things are just off. They really don't capture the, the, the Asian things. So they are more kind of uh, oxy, a Westerner in the buildings and some things like that. But basically this kind of speaks of about consumption of luxury within Mexico. But now let's talk about basically the payment, which is silver. What, the, what, what would Mexicans use to pay for Chinese goods or for Asian goods? And we have evidence that Chinese mostly just accepted silver. So when we talk about commerce in Asia, the Indians, the Japanese and other people actually accepted other kinds of Mexican goods that were exported, but Chinese mostly just accepted silver. And of course, America is famous for having a lot of 
silvering mines. In, the, in, in South America, the Potosí mine is the most important one, but in Mexico, in the middle and northern parts, there are a lot of silvers. And also many of that uh, was exported to Europe. A lot of it was also actually used to buy this kind of uh, Chinese goods. And so what you see in China, in, in Manila, is that the Chinese mostly at the beginning of the 16th, 17th centuries, mostly they melted kind of the silver, the Spanish silver coins, and they used the silver just for uh, internal markets. But what we see interesting uh, development in the 18th century is that the Chinese people kind of realized what the rest of the world had already realized, which is that the Spanish minted coins were valuable, not just because of the content of silver, but because of the quality of the coin itself. So one of very important things in monetary economics is that the money must be kind of stable and must be uniform. And this is kind of common nowadays to think about a bill nowadays, which is kind of just paper and says it has it holds value. But in the past, it was quite difficult to achieve kind of a level of dexterity that the same amount, the same coin, different coins, but the same model will have kind of the same weight. And sometimes it was actually even worse with, the, with governments that had an incentive to devaluate, to put less amount of silver in this kind of coins. But the world realized that the Spanish were quite, quite good at doing these things. They were not only good at making kind of a uniform set of coins, but also that they were good in the, that they were trustworthy. Whatever they said that the money had in terms of silver in weight, the money had it. So that meant that it was basically, the, it was what we can consider kind of the first monetary standard. And well, it was being used in Europe, it was being used in North America, in the United States, but it was also being used in Asia. And here we see kind of some chop mark coins, which is basically the Spanish minted coin. This one is minted in Mexico City and had some chops, basically private chops about basically there's, as, as far as I'm aware, there's no systematic study about the, the what specifically these uh, chops mean. I mean, the, if you are uh, Chinese, you know maybe what this symbol means, the sign means, but in terms of the, the, the historical relevance, it's quite difficult to assess. But what we know is that specifically in the 19th century, some of these guides started to appear in China just to identify what kind of um, a good a money they were talking about. And in fact, this was so relevant that it did not disappear even after Latin America's wars of independence. We have evidence of Mexican coins circulating freely in China up until the late 19th century, in which basically people will talk about Mexicans because that's where basically these things were, were, were minted. They came from Mexico. So uh, silver was quite relevant and mostly the, that was what was being exported. So what other goods did America produce? Honestly, not many, but we have evidence of other luxurious goods that were actually accepted in Europe and were actually quite demanded. The one that was most demanded, it was this kind of dye, which had a very intense red, carmine red, which was extracted from some insect in Mexico from cacti. And the interesting thing, even though it was quietly, uh, quite highly demanded in Europe, it was never really demanded in, in China. Even though it was a nice thing and a dye, it was really never demanded. It started to being demanded up only until basically late 18th century, uh, late 18th century and the beginnings of the 19th century. It was mostly because people in uh, Dutch Indonesia basically, basically uh, were uh, uh, copied, uh, brought the, the insect from Mexico and they successfully uh, achieve kind of the process that the Mexicans already did. So basically, Chinese had a, a larger access to the source in Indonesia rather than to go to Mexico. But we don't have evidence of this kind of goods. So that begs the question about what exactly, uh, why exactly did this happen? And also, it also leads to the question about why did the Mexicans didn't produce anything else? And this relates to the political economy. And with this, I will actually end because I, I think I already kind of overextended. Then I will talk a little bit about the economics of the year and how everything that I've sp spoke about relates to it. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is that the Spanish Empire was huge. So it's very similar in that regard to China, in this, but it's different. Of course, there are many differences, but China is also huge. China is an inla inland empire, but uh, Spain was a sea empire. But it also meant that it was quite difficult, basically, to connect uh, different regions. So there was a level high of autonomy and what we would consider kind of the state uh, presence in all the areas was really not that high. So Mexicans had to deal 
basically with themselves and Peruvians had to deal with themselves. They technically obeyed the king of Spain, of course, but they had mostly, the king acted most, mo- mostly as an arbiter between the different merchant elites or the different elites. And this led basically later on to the, the, uh, the, the silver and basically as a source of wealth from for the Spaniards led to a very peculiar way of political economy in which the merchantmen had kind of monopoly access to it and later on had monopoly access to the goods that were imported that then assured more or less kind of a peculiar instance of inequality within Latin America that more or less persists up until this day. If you look into the inequality levels in Latin America, they are among the highest and that has persisted across time. So what you see in Latin America developing across this period is that first, there are many, many rich people, of course, and this has been true since the 16th century that will actually consume goods from China, from Europe, from the rest of the world, but there were also many, many poor people. And the basic in that regard, and I can talk more in detail about what we will consider in economics more or less a resource course, silver, which basically gave access to this merchantmen to these all kinds of goods, kind of was a curse because that meant that an industry like in Northern Europe was never actually achieved. We, as I previously stated, it was mostly kind of an industry of copying things that really never developed. And with that, I think I, I close and I thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando. So um, we, we've now seen what things looked like on the Atlantic side of this trade. And I wanna switch to the East Asian side. And the first thing to realize is that for China, this trade was not initially about luxury imports per se. It was about the monetary base of the overall economy. China had for centuries used bronze coins for local retail transactions, but they're too bulky and low value for big transactions. By about the year 1000, long before anybody else, they were using paper money for the big transactions. But in their last years in power, the Mongols had badly overprinted um, starting about 1350. And then the early Ming, the Chinese dynasty that took over when the Mongols fell, had really completely messed things up between about 1368 and 1420. Um, They minted very, very few coins, which created an enormous market for counterfeiters who filled the gap. And they issued paper money so untrustworthy that it rapidly lost about 99% of its value. As the economy began recovering in the 1400s, partly because the Ming finally changed their policies, it needed a monetary base. And it began by sucking in lots and lots of silver and some copper from Japan. Then in the late 1500s, just as Japanese silver exports started declining, silver started to flood in from Latin America in return for things like silk and porcelain and later tea. And this happened on an unprecedented scale. Between the early 1500s and the early 1800s, somewhere between 80 to 90% of all precious metals mined in the entire world were mined in Latin America. Of that, somewhere between a quarter and a third of, at least of the silver, eventually wound up in China, which is particularly remarkable when you remember there weren't Chinese ships going to Latin America, nor was Latin America, of course, ruled by Chinese. At any rate, loads of silver comes in in return for things like silk and porcelain, and the greatly increased money supply that created greased the wheels of general economic expansion, not just luxury demand. But luxury demand of a different type became very important in several ways. And so if you think about what was considered luxury in China in this period, basically it divides into two kinds of goods. There are high-end artisanal manufacturers, things like silk, the better qualities of porcelain, lacquerware, et cetera. And that was all produced domestically within the empire. And then there were what the Chinese considered to be exotic natural products, which were sourced from outside. 
So jade from Central Asia, aromatic woods and shark's fins and so forth from Southeast Asia, furs, ginseng, and freshwater pearls from the Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, and Northeast Asia. And some of the Northeast Asian goods, which come from relatively low temperature forests, which is where, for instance, you get the fur bearing animals, used to come from within China. But the forests within China were badly overcut during the late Ming economic boom. So increasingly, forest goods have to come from Manchuria, Korea, and Siberia. As lots of silver flooded into China, maybe close to a fifth of it went back out again to buy these luxury forest goods. And this had profound social, cultural, and political effects. First of all, the commercial boom made some people rich. And many of the newly rich wanted to convert their wealth into status. And we see two crucial signs of this that are really related to luxury consumption. And if Veblen had read Chinese, he would love these examples. Um, so first, starting around 1500, you start to see books being published in China that tell readers how to consume in ways that will give them a reputation for having taste as well as money and therefore confer status. So these books have things like tips for buying and displaying art, one of them, which must have been aimed at very rich readers, says that it's really tacky to hang major art masterpieces on all four walls of any one room. They tell you how to spot fake antiques, what to wear on what occasions, kind of a early modern dress for success, and so on. These books indicate that there were significant numbers of people who could afford luxury objects but had not grown up among people who could teach them how to consume in prestigious ways. They had to learn it. And they also tell you that there were some people from old money families who facing increased social competition, marketed their knowledge of luxury rather than keeping it within their original social networks the way they would have a couple of generations before. So that's one big sign that the commercial boom is shaking up status and that luxury consumption is a big part of that new social competition. Secondly, the Ming, like most monarchies of its time, had numerous sumptuary laws. These are laws that regulated what you were allowed to consume based on your social rank, regardless of what you could afford. Laws that said, for instance, that only people who held certain offices or had passed a certain level in China's civil service exams, could wear certain kinds of silk or have carriages of a certain size or hats with peacock feathers. You had many laws like this too in Europe, except there they tended to be based on things like whether you were born with a noble title or not. And again, they said, doesn't matter if you have the money to purchase this, you have to be of a certain rank. In the 16th century, as global trade increased the variety of luxury goods that were available in a given place and the number of people who could afford those goods, governments, both in China and the West, had to keep issuing new sumptuary laws to maintain old social hierarchies. So you ban sable pelts one year and then the nouveau riche show up in mink the next year. So you ban mink and then they show up in Martin pelts and so on and so on. And then significantly, beginning in the middle 1600s, the Chinese government and also some, but not all European governments reversed themselves and stopped enforcing most sumptuary laws. They sometimes still scolded people for buying certain things, but essentially they gave up. And from then on, what kinds of consumption were prestigious began to be governed more by fashion than by laws. And that marks the emergence of consumerism as opposed to just consumption. So all societies feature consumption, but consumerism marks a characteristically modern condition 
in which what you consume and are seen consuming is crucial to determining your status rather than your status as determined outside the economy by things like birth or success on the battlefield or success in the competition for government office, things like that, used to determine what you were allowed to consume. And this is a huge shift. And it's one of the reasons why so many historians now talk about the 16th to 18th century in many parts of the world as early modern, whereas we used to simply talk about them as pre-modern, right? And what early modern indicates, among other things, is that the attitudes and some of the institutional structures of the modern world are there, even though the technologies aren't yet. Growing luxury trade also had cultural and intellectual consequences. So the profits of the silver trade were huge and they continued for decades. So when the same amount of silver bought twice as much gold in Guangzhou as it did in Amsterdam, which was the case for a good chunk of the 17th century, then simple arbitrage is gonna keep the boats moving. You don't have to be a commercial genius to figure out that if gold is worth twice as much, excuse me, silver is worth twice as much gold in Guangzhou than Amsterdam, get a boat and move the, move the stuff to, to Guangzhou. And once the boats are going, people like missionaries who had their own non-commercial motives for travel will hitch rides. And Jesuit missionaries in particular were among 16th to 18th century Europe's leading intellectuals. They brought Copernican astronomy, Renaissance painting techniques, and a whole lot else to China, while Chinese classic texts, among other things, went to Europe. The Chinese texts were not widely read, at least at first, but once they were translated and started to spread, they conveyed what many Europeans considered to be really radical ideas. For instance, the idea that government officials should not be chosen based on hereditary status, but on some notion of merit, which in China meant the exam system. And this had an enormous impact, for instance, on the European enlightenment. Lastly, for now, there were geopolitical consequences. All of this social mobility was somewhat destabilizing. Also for China, it was somewhat destabilizing having much of their money supply come from abroad and therefore fluctuate for often unpredictable reasons. If the Manila Galleon didn't make it one year, and close to 15% of the ships never did make it, they sank or were raided by pirates or whatever, it had a real impact on the Chinese money supply because it meant a whole bunch of silver just didn't arrive. And as I mentioned before, lots of the silver entering China also went back out, especially to the Northeast, in return for furs, ginseng, and other forest goods. And that silver flow to the Northeast turns out to have been critical to the early Manchus, who gained control of a lot of this Northeastern trade um, and used the profits to build their state, luring in the leaders of other semi-nomadic peoples by offering them fancy gifts, so things like silk, silver jewelry, et cetera. They also lured in skilled craftsmen, including Chinese artisans who were in making imitations of European style cannon, another good that traveled on these ships. And later on, also building a literate bureaucracy by luring disaffected Chinese literati into Southern Manchuria. So just as the silver trade and the monopolization of the luxury goods that came in in return for silver were crucially important to building very wealthy, politically powerful families in the Americas, who later split with Spain. So in China, the control of not the silver coming into China, but the silver going back out from it in return for East Asian luxuries turned out to be crucial to building powerful concentrations of wealth and other resources among the Manchu elite. So in effect, Ming luxury consumption financed the dynasty that ultimately replaced them. So I'll leave it there. 
um, gives us quite a bit of time for discussion. Um, I think first Fernando and I will talk amongst ourselves for a few minutes and then we'll turn it to, over to the audience. So let me just start by asking Fernando if there's anything he feels like adding at this point. So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think this is kind of a good complement in terms of what is happening in America and in China. And I think one thing that I didn't uh, explain as well is just the fact that the autonomy within the different American regions also basically created some kind of political divergence between the different regions. One thing that we know existed in the 16th century is that the Spanish in Spain actually asked petition the Spanish king, for example, to abandon the Philippines. Why? It's because the Mexicans were basically preferring to buy uh, Chinese goods rather than to buy from them in Europe. So that created kind of conflict within Spain itself, within the Spanish Empire. And this is something to, to, to really, to really acknowledge. it's important to acknowledge. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting. And I guess one of the things that I'd want to add thinking about the comparison is we often think of the Chinese monarchy as being particularly powerful and centralized and even despotic. Yep. And certainly the Ming aspired to that at certain moments. But what's really striking from the Chinese side of this is how bottom up the whole process is, right? So, you know, one response to the state's failure to, mint, to create an adequate money supply is counterfeiting on an enormous scale. Another is printing private paper money. A third is this import of silver, which as Fernando pointed out, has these chops on it. And what those chops usually are is that some prominent merchant saying, I have evaluated this coin and I, and I promise you it's good. You have my word. Because that's of course a crucial thing for money, right? Yeah. What makes a dollar bill valuable is that it's really hard to copy. It looks simple, but it isn't. And so when you get this thing, you know what it's worth. Yep. Part of the problem with barter trade is that it's very hard for the parties to be expert enough in evaluating what they're being what they're being offered. Right? Money is a standardized thing, right? Even a five-year-old can learn to distinguish between a $20 bill and a $1 bill, or between real dollar bills and monopoly money. But if you're offering me diamonds in return for my goods, the vast majority of us have no idea how to evaluate diamonds, yeah. right? So money requires confirmation from an expert. And what most of those chops are is simply somebody saying, I've looked at this coin recently, it hasn't been clipped, taking a little silver off. It's not a fake. But all of this happening from the bottom up is both testimony to the dynamism of Chinese society, but it's also incredibly inefficient to have you know, thousands of separate merchants verifying your money rather than having a central monetary standard. And that's one of the things why it's a big deal in the later in the 18th and 19th century, when the Chinese do become more familiar with European coins, and instead of melting them down, they just say, oh, you know, we know that a Carlos III peso is really good. You know, we trust that. Yeah. Another, interesting, another interesting thing that is happening in America is the paradox that there's a debate in the literature about Basically, so much silver is being exported that there is not enough to actually trade within Latin America. So there's kind of a scarcity of money in some places because the arbitrage opportunities elsewhere are so high. So you see, paradoxically, is that within some regions in Latin America and Spanish America, some alternative to silver coins or are being used, even paper money in some cases in some regions, in some localities, of course, not, not across the, the whole 
trading network. But you see that appearing precisely because there's a, such a huge demand of American silver that there is not enough to actually be used in Latin America. And this is just a huge debate that has not been resolved in the literature, why this is happening exactly. Another thing I thought was kind of interesting is that, you know, Fernando mentioned quite rightly that one of the things you get in the Americas is that local artisans start to produce, produce knockoffs of Chinese goods. It's not as widely known, but the same thing happens in China, where, for instance, in the 18th century, for some reason, there's an enormous craze for Swiss cuckoo clocks. Uh -huh. And artisans in Hangzhou and Suzhou start to produce copies of them. Um, in fact, some of you people in the audience may know the famous letter from the Chenlong Emperor in the 1790s to King George of England saying, basically, we don't need your goods. We have everything we want. You know, we don't want your, we don't want your stuff, basically. What's not as commonly known is that that letter was not primarily aimed at George. Copies were made and it was distributed in major Chinese cities. It was aimed at Chinese elites whom the emperor felt were wasting a lot of money on things like copies of Swiss cuckoo clocks to say to them, you don't need this European stuff. You know, this should not be prestigious, but it's very hard even for an emperor to fight fashion and rich people kept collecting all sorts of stuff that the central government did not approve of. Another thing that I would like to emphasize, as you mentioned, is not only the flow of merchandises, but also of ideas. And I think one thing to notice is that unlike the Dutch or the British, the basically the incentives, although we are focusing on trade on this talk, the initial incentives of the Portuguese and the Spanish in kind of conquering all these lands or reaching all these lands was also in terms of evangelization. So they have a, they were huge preachers. So that's why they were expelled from a lot of Asian lands. So basically the arrival of basically Christianity into Asia was to them and the expansion of the ideas was quite relevant to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Let's see. So we're starting to get some questions from the audience. And I guess there's one that looks like it's it's mostly for me and I'll answer it quickly. So um, we had an audience member who said that some say that the Ming dynasty had imported inflation by bringing in all these, by allowing these silver coins to come in. Do you agree? And actually I would disagree. I would say what the Ming did by letting the silver come in is that they avoided a very drastic deflation. Because as I said, they were they were not minting anywhere near enough coins to run the economy. Nobody trusted their paper money, and they eventually gave up um, producing it. The economy needed some kind of monetary base. Um, some of it was coming from counterfeiting. And in fact, there's at least some evidence to suggest that the Chinese government tolerated a lot of counterfeiting, partly because they just viewed it as a cheap alternative to print to minting more money themselves. Um, but bronze coins are heavy. It's something like in the 18th century, it was something like six kilos of bronze coin equaled about one ounce of silver in value. So that's a ratio of roughly 200 to one. Um, you don't want to do large scale, long distance commerce using something really bulky like that. And so cups, the silver coming in was enormously useful. Um, the Ming certainly paid a price for not providing a reliable currency themselves, right? Because they exported all this porcelain, and silk and so forth, all this productive capacity that could have been domestically focused instead went into paying for a money supply to be produced in the Latin American mines and mints. But I don't think it's the problem is inflation. I think the problem is that the silver was a necessary substitute for something the government was failing to do. 
Bernadette, did you want to comment on that at all? Well, yeah, yeah. In the economic literature, I would say that the way in which we treat it is different. There's difference between China and Europe. In Europe, it's more like an exogenous shock of money that is arriving to Europe that causes inflation. And there's a huge literature about that. And in China, it's more like the demand is so huge that really there's never enough silver to actually satisfy the Chinese clients. So yeah, they, they shouldn't really, if just basic, the supply and demand, it shouldn't actually create any, uh, I mean, in itself, it should not create inflation. Okay, we've got a, a very general question and I'll, I think, hand this one to Fernando first, because I'm not even sure if we have the same answer to it, which is what determines what is considered luxury and how has it changed over time? So, <laughs> So I would say that the first characteristic that it needs to have is that it's basically a thing that is restricted. So it's not readily available for everyone to consume. That is basically the idea that it's only available for those people either at the elite or that have kind of access to it because X or Y reasons. That is one of the first prerequisites. And then how it changes through history, I think it depends. That's why I started with the idea of clothes, comparing them to porcelain. So I think for spices, are things that used to be luxury because they are were very uh, they were quietly demanded. Because if you look, I mean, nowadays when we think about sugar, it's a common thing. But in the past, it was not as common. In fact, there are many evidence or reference of European kings actually having their uh, their teeth rotten because of the well, they had access to a lot of sugar, so they consume a lot and they just overjoyed in it. So it's really quite enjoyable to actually eat those things. And that was luxurious back then because they had to transport it from large distances. Nowadays, it's not as luxurious because we have them readily available, but still quite useful. Now, what is luxury and still it relates to social status that remains luxurious to time. So Chinese porcelain today is as luxurious as it was 500 years ago, if not more, because really the, the ability of, of artisans to produce it is quite limited and only few people could actually have access to it, but it in itself does not solve a problem that just a typical ceramic or a typical thing that I could buy from, I don't know, $1 or less could actually satisfy. It's just kind of pure aesthetic reasons or pure social signaling, which is everything about Luxurious as defined by Bevelin. So I think they are both, and that determines kind of the political spectrum or the political institutions determine which is which. Is which. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. And I'd just add a couple of, of additional things. One is that sometimes the physical properties of the thing actually really do matter because, for instance, they make it difficult to produce. Um, the British try duplicating Chinese tea. They steal British, uh, Chinese tea plants. They smuggle them out of China and they try to make them grow in various places in their empire took them over a hundred years to finally get it right and get a tea industry going in India. And there were many, many false starts along the way because it just happens to be a fairly fragile plant that only grows in a few places. Sugar, on the other hand, starts out, it's originally, um, as far as we can tell, botanically, it comes from New Guinea, um, spreads through Southeast Asia into India. Um, but originally, again, limited number of locations where it was produced, and that was part of what made it very expensive in Europe. The result, the consequence, of course, is that the European powers try to develop their own domestic sugar supplies. They create plantations, first in the Canary Islands and the Mediterranean, and then in the Americas. And in that case, they get it right relatively fast, or at least they get it right from a botanical point of view. They get it horribly wrong from a social point of view because there's stuff is produced under hideous conditions with you know, brutal, brutal labor. But sugar you know, pretty rapidly becomes cheap because they figure out how to mass produce it quickly. Um, the other thing is that some of the early modern goods, by no means all, but some of them the early modern luxuries share the characteristic that they're at least somewhat addictive. Tobacco, coffee, tea, sugar, um, later opium, um, going in the other direction. 
you know, that alone doesn't make something a luxury. Um, and not all luxuries have that characteristic, but it is an interesting feature of the early modern world and perhaps sort of helps overcome some of the resistance and friction that's inhibiting long distance trade that so many of the early modern luxury goods are at least mildly addictive in a physical sense. But I would agree with Fernando that the main determinants are social, right? You know, a, a Dior dress does not keep the person who's wearing it any warmer than an off the rack dress from Walmart. It's a matter of social prestige. Um, and this is true for all sorts of stuff. You know, it, it's valuable because it's rare and it's rare because it's expensive. It's a kind of cycle. Let's see. Okay, so we've got another question <clears throat> that says about, this is a more narrow and technical one. I mentioned that about somewhere between a quarter and a third of New World silver flowed eventually to China through the galleon trades, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> others argue that together about half of the New World bindings went to China. Um, and you know, how do we reconcile those two differences? And there I would say the answer is partly just, you know, our records are incomplete. Mm. And so there's always going to be some ambiguity. The reason I opt for the lower estimate is that the people who estimated a half winding up in China, what they were basically doing was they were comparing the amount of silver that winds up in China in particular and other parts of Asia with what winds up in Europe. And they were neglecting the part of Latin American silver that remains within the Americas. And increasingly, I think what historians are finding is that that amount that remained circulating within the Americas was bigger than we realized. That there's a lot of stuff being smuggled out of the mines and it's going to fuel internal commerce of various sorts, much of which was not reported, but was real nonetheless. And so that makes the base bigger and it makes the overall amount that winds up in China smaller as a percentage. I don't know, Fernando, did you have anything you wanted to say on that? No, no, not really. I mean, I, I would just totally agree with you. Like the records are incomplete and just having a world estimate, this is kind of a global market trying to find figures from the circulation from America to Europe and how Europe then goes back to, Amer to, to China again. So it's quite difficult in general. So what we have are, yeah, estimates just. Yeah. Um, let's see, we've got another question that asks, how was the trade between Asia with the Spaniards different than the trade with the Dutch and the Portuguese in this early modern period? Um, Fernando, do you want to start us off? Or Yeah, I would say first and foremost, it's just kind of the uh, trading route. So the Portuguese, so in the 16th century, there were only Portuguese and Spanish. And just kind of the trading road, so goods going directly to Europe through Africa, and then the other goods going to America first, and then maybe to Europe, because as I've stated, a lot of the Chinese goods stayed within America. And that was kind of the main difference. But when the Dutch arrived, basically in the late 17th century, well, mostly that's where they peak, they kind of create an alternative route also through Africa, because the, the, the Dutch do not have access to America, of course, but the incentives change and you see a lot of political developments change within Asia uh, because of that. So the Chinese, the Japanese realize that they had actually a bargaining power because they no longer only have to actually trade with the Portuguese or the Spanish. And at this point in time, I remember in the, from 1580 to 1640, Spain and Portugal were unified under one crown. So that meant that more or less even though they were not really the same nation, they had kind of some agreements to not compete with each other in different areas. So both when the, for the, the Dutch arrived, 
they changed the whole circumstances and they improved the bargaining position of the Asians, of course. And that also allows, for example, the famous the, the, the exp, expulsion of uh, the Portuguese and Spanish priests within Japan, the Tokugawa period and so on, but also similar things start occurring within China. So it just kind of improves the, 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 the position of the Asian countries. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'd add, though, which is interesting, is that though the coming of the Dutch does increase the bargaining power of both the Japanese and the Chinese, in the end, both the Tokugawa and the Qing more or less throw that advantage away. Because the Tokugawa welcome the Dutch and kick out the Spanish and Portuguese. So they're back to dealing with only one foreign vendor. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> the Chinese similarly had heard from client states in Southeast Asia that the Dutch were troublemakers, which was more or less true. Um, I mean, the Dutch entry into Southeast Asia was extremely violent. And the Chinese decide to basically keep the Dutch at arm's length. Um, the Dutch then try to set themselves up on Taiwan, where eventually they are kicked out. But there's a period where the Qing, well, the late Ming and Qing also, by excluding the Dutch, find themselves dealing with more or less one vendor. That then changes again in the 18th century, and the Chinese allow a whole bunch of different European traders to come to Canton, or Guangzhou, if you prefer. Um, but you know, not everybody always sees the advantages of competition. Sometimes if what you want is order, it's yeah, sometimes yeah. better to have one trading partner whom you can hold responsible. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think as we previously even discussed, the one thing that the Spanish and Portuguese differ from the Dutch is that they were proselytizers. So that meant that they spread Christianity. The Dutch didn't care about that. The Dutch were just for the trading. But that also implied that maybe political instability in Asia was important. That's why the Spanish and Portuguese were expelled from Japan because they, in the South, they were creating problems for the, for the Shogun. Right. Yeah. Um, in fact, the, the Dutch East India Company has this complicated game that they play, because on the one hand, they can't squat the Dutch Reformed Church completely in their overseas colonies both because they count on them to help keep social order and because well, squashing the Dutch Reformed Church within their colonies would offend their board of directors back in Amsterdam. On the other hand, they recognize that the um, missionaries keep getting them in trouble with the Chinese, Japanese, Javanese, etc. authorities because they're always trying to interfere with indigenous religion or to push a religion that the local rulers regard as heretical. And so they have to play this kind of funny game um, where they, they tolerate the, mission, the missionaries, but they really try to limit them as much as they can. Whereas in the Spanish and Portuguese case, at least for a while, the missionaries are probably actually more powerful than the merchants. That shifts over time. But yeah. um, we've got a couple of other questions that came from the audience early on. So I'm just going to go through them quickly because we don't have much time. But one person asks how the recent discovery of a bunch of Venetian glass in Alaska changes our perceptions of east-west trade, whether it does. Um, the second asks how trade affects the supply and demand for gold and silver during this period, which are different. And then the third asks, what were the rich countries during these, the period we're talking about? And what was the measurement for wealth? And I'll, we'll lump those questions together. Fernando, take all of them, none of them, however you want, okay. and then I'll do the same. So, I mean, for the first one, I think it does not change. I mean, the Venetian glass is kind of an interesting discovery of basically a Venetian artifact, Venetian glass discovery in Alaska that basically arrived there through basically China, through Asia. So which 
basically tells us that trade is complex across all times. But I don't think that changes the way in which we see the world. I mean, it's just kind of one anecdote. This is really, there's no trading route there. It's just like, I mean, just maybe by pure randomness, by pure chance, something arrived. So I do not think it changes our worldview. It's just, I mean, at least now, if we find more evidence, then maybe we will be enlightened. But so far, I don't think it changes that much. For the second one, I think that's it's a broad question about the supply and demand for gold and silver. So I don't think I can add much more to, to what we have been discussed. And for the third one, I, I think I prefer just to let you talk, which because you, you are the expert on divergence and so on in this period. Okay, let me take the same three questions. On the first one, I would completely agree with Fernanda. I mean, it's very interesting. So these Venetian glass beads turn up in what is now Alaska. They can be dated at somewhere between 1440 and 1480, which means that they get to the Americas before Columbus. But it probably doesn't change our view of overall trade very much. What it suggests is that those beads probably came to Beijing. They probably went from Beijing up to Northeast Asia. I would guess again, probably in exchange for something like furs or um, ginseng or other kind of cold weather forest products, freshwater pearls or another. And then whoever got a hold of them in Northeast Asia swap them again to the Inuit in what's now Alaska, quite likely for something like seal pelts, but we don't really know. And it's, a, as far as we know, a very small scale trade that doesn't really affect our story. Um, the stuff about silver and gold is fascinating and really puzzling. And one of the things that's weird about Chinese history is that for reasons we do not understand, the Chinese have almost never used gold as a monetary metal in the whole 2,600 years that there have been Chinese coins. There have been almost no gold ones, whereas gold, of course, is heavily in demand as a monetary metal in India, in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in various parts of Africa. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you can get much more silver, or, or rather you can get much more gold for your silver in let's say Guangzhou than you can in Amsterdam and it helps fuel the arbitrage trade. But we don't really understand it all that well. And then for the last one, what were the rich countries during the 300 years, these 300 years and what's the measurement of evaluation? Um, to take the second part first, we do have reconstructions, very rough reconstructions of GDP per capita. And what they suggest is that there aren't really big differences until the middle, at the earliest, the middle of the 18th century or the end probably even of the 18th century. The second thing is that it's not actually clear that GDP per capita is the best measure of welfare in societies where, in every society, the largest majority of the people were poor. So that something like having a good safety net that meant that when the harvest fluctuated, you didn't starve, might well have been much more important to the welfare of the average person in this period than GDP per capita, right? If most of your population in any given year is let's say within 25% of the subsistence income and the harvests fluctuate because of weather or whatever, then being able to dampen those fluctuations may actually matter more than being 30% above subsistence as opposed to 20%. It may matter more that you can keep the deviation around that mean small. And so we do have some other alternative measures of wealth that are quite interesting, but they're also complicated and I can't quite get into them. As far as what the rich areas were, um, so within Europe, by the 18th century, it's pretty clear that the Netherlands and England have pulled away from the pack. 
um, that they are significantly richer than the next richest places, which are probably mostly cities in Northern Italy, some in France. Um, Eastern Europe is significantly behind, et cetera. China, even though we think of it as a single country, has enormous regional inequalities. Um, the richest areas, the Yangtze Delta, is probably as rich as England and Holland and remains so at least until about 1750. Um, some people would argue 1720, but I think 1750 is safer, maybe even 1800. But just as Europe has an enormous gap between Amsterdam and let's say what is now Romania, China has an equally large gap between the Yangtze Delta and a place like Gansu in the Northwest. Um, there are also very uh, high income centers in what is now Japan, maybe on the West Coast of India, though that's less clear. Um, what's really weird though, and it speaks to the unreliability of GDP as a measure, if you simply wanted to look at what places have the highest per capita cash income in the world in the late 18th century, it's almost certainly Jamaica and Haiti two slave economies that are producing enormous amounts of um, sugar and coffee. And yet most of the population on those islands is absolutely miserable. And of course, the sugar and coffee slave economy did not produce a good basis for sustainable development going forward. Um, so measures of GDP can be deceptive. Um, and I think we are, well, we can probably take one or two more questions. Let's see. What have we got here? The chat is telling me two new messages. Um, so I think the last one we've got says, some say that the silver played an important role in the creation of a capitalist economy in this era. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, Fernando, do you want to take that? So I, I think there is some evidence in with, within Latin America, for example, Regions closer to the mines created the most capitalist places in Latin America. There's kind of a burgeoning trade of goods there. But I I mean, there's still not enough that we can say that this they, they definitely affected. In fact, as I previously stated, the opposite, in fact, played a, a larger role, which is the fact that given that Latin America uh, had such a comparative, comparative advantage on producing and exporting silver that basically outweighed other productive opportunities. That meant that in fact actually played against it. At least that's the case from the producer of silver. So in that regard, I would say that the literature is more to the opposite side. And in fact, what we see, one thing that I like to stress always is that when we think about the trading eras and we think about mercantilism period, Really, the Spanish and the Portuguese, at least uh, before the 18th century, were really more like medieval traders. So the trading routes occurred through trading first. That's why they occurred in Manila. They were trading first there. That's really, really people gathering in some places and really just bargaining. And then they went to Mexico, Acapulco, and the same thing occurred. And the same thing occurred with Europeans. So this is quite a medieval form of trade. The mercantilist policies, which basically later on will spur kind of a more a commercial tradition, which more seen later on with the Dutch East India Company and later on with the English India Companies and so on. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I just, you know, part of what the question of whether this trade creates, helps create capitalism depends on how you define capitalism. Certainly it created a lot of capitalists <laughs> individuals who got very rich and reinvested their money in order to make more and more. But in some cases, what they reinvested their money in was creating monopoly privileges. And so if by capitalism, you, need a, you mean a free market economy, in some cases, the effect of this was actually to squash the free market economy. It varied a lot from place to place. The other thing I would say, something that neither of us has talked about much, but that is very important is that a lot of this wealth also goes into funding violence, right? So the Spanish monarchy is almost constantly at war in Europe. Um, in particular, they're constantly at war with the Dutch, 
And though we know in retrospect that the Dutch win, that was by no means certain at the time. And you could easily have had an outcome in which the Spanish monarchy with the aid of all their silver in America crushed the Dutch in Amsterdam, the Armada could have won in England, and the things that eventually did become the early centers of the global capitalist economy might have wound up being set back by the effects of silver rather than pushed forward. You know, history is always, always contingent. Weird things can happen. And with that, I think I would like to thank Fernando, thank our audience, and turn things back over to Mark to close the program. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ken and Fernando. That's really interesting historical perspective on uh, our view of luxury. And uh, we do have a brief poll tonight for the program for the audience that is watching on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers in the comments as always. And while you complete the survey, I wanna tell you a little bit more about our upcoming hybrid trailblazer forum program on October 21st. Um, this time we have uh, one of CNN's most senior executives globally, uh, Elena Lee, who will be sharing her career path and success in drawing attention to the climate crisis and women's rights. We hope you can join us uh, for our next Trailblazer Forum program, either in person or uh, online on Zoom. Also, please don't forget about our new podcast called The Course. Uh, we feature a growing list of UChicago faculty who share their journey on how they became a UChicago professor. You can find Professor Pomerantz on the course. He was our first episode contributor. And uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen, which will take you to our UChicago Hong Kong website to find all of the episodes. I think we have about 35 or so of them now. And you can also find the course on many of the other podcast platforms listed below. Have a great night in Hong Kong and a wonderful day wherever you may be. Good night. <laughs>